Welcome to Performance Anxiety. This week we welcome David Schramm of The Shrams. We talk about the new album, Omnidirectional. He tells us what happens when your bass gets stolen. He works with Yola Tango. Enjoy this week's episode of Performance Anxiety with David Schramm. Follow them on Instagram and Twitter. Follow us on both of those mediums at Performance ANX. Buy things at performanceanx.threadless.com. And remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Enjoy David Schramm of The Shrams. Hi, this is Dave Schramm. You're listening to Performance Anxiety uh, with Mark Shea and, and I guess me tonight. So there you go. All right, well, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see. You are... I, I, I was doing research on you, and I found that there are quite a few David Shrams out there. Yeah, there are. There's some some ones that I'd like to, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe talk to, but uh, maybe some... Um, never, never mind. Never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not, a, you know, a football coach. You're not a deceased astrophysicist, a luthier. No, or, no. And... You know, I'm not, an, th- th- not an actor on wings either. Exactly, you yeah. didn't play Roy Biggins. Yeah. yeah. So that's got to set the expectations for the listeners. So you're the guitarist, yeah. David Schramm. If I had to choose, I might be the astrophysicist. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Except he's dead now, I think. Yeah, but that's true. Maybe that's not a that's a not a good selling point there. No. <laughs> so you're let's see, you're uh, you're from Long Island originally. That's true. And is that where you? grew up and, and you started getting into music? Yeah, I grew up in Levittown, Long Island. Little houses of Ticky Tacky, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah. And uh, total suburbia. Um, my musical um, my musical youth was misspent listening to um, well, the standard stuff, but also uh, uh, Frank Zapp and the Mother's Invention and Captain Beefheart and his Magic Band and Things of that ilk, and um, I guess I kind of thought myself, what's the word, more creative than the the Tull Band and the Birds Band, and you know, okay. we had Battle of the Bands around around the the suburban suburban developments there, and they would reel out the bandmobile to the local park, yeah, and they would have a band that played. Aqualong, and then the next band would come on. They do all birds covers, and then there would be a band that did the Zep covers. Oh yeah, yeah. And we got up there once, maybe twice, um, uh, and made no impression because we played all our own songs. Oh. <laughs> and we had a cellist in the band, so. Oh wow. Yeah, so it was a little different for us. We didn't get much in the way of. Uh, <laughs> It was none of that. Because <laughs> everyone wanted to hear the Skinner and the Zep and, and all that. Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But now I did read that while you are in high school that you did write a symphonic piece that was uh, performed oh, by the geez. local orchestra. Where did you dredge that up? Yeah. Um, I do my research, man. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, no, in college <laughs> I wrote something. Uh, yeah, in college I wrote something that was played by a local community orchestra. That's pretty yeah. crazy. I, I, how hard is it to write a symphonic piece? I've... Never even thought about something it like that. It was short. It was <laughs> only about five minutes long, so that was easier. Right? It wasn't Beethoven. It was, okay. yeah. And so you're out in, in Long Island. So you're, you're, you're in relative proximity to, to New York City. And also, yeah. uh, when you get to the age where you're going out and seeing bands, what, what, kind, of, what kind of music are you going out to see? Uh, well, wow. This is a good setup because I can tell you my first concert. Yes. Um, uh, Town Hall, 1973. Okay. Uh, uh, the clearest part tour of Captain Beefheart. Oh wow! So that was a pretty amazing show. Um, the strange thing about the sh- so show was that the uh, support acts were um, well, first a, a Lee Michaels copy band guy on guy on uh, drums and a guy on organ. Oh wow! Uh, and then Larry Coryell. Really? And then Captain Beefheart. So that was really strange. But once we got to the captain, everything was okay. Yeah. He came out in this <laughs> pink satin cape. 
uh, chugging a bottle of Jack Daniels and uh, <laughs> the rest is history. Well, that almost makes sense for a, a beef heart show, though. Oh, almost. totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this is something completely different, yeah. So what what uh, musical instruments did you start with? Did you start off on guitar, or was it, was it something that you grew into? Earliest, I, I played clarinet. Oh, know? wow. My grandfather... On my my mother's father was a uh, had a polka band and had some records on OK and Columbia. Oh, cool! Seventy eights though, seventy eights. Oh, uh, uh, Dmitri Patachik, and uh, he played clarinet and had a little band. Wow! Um, I've looked for the seventy eights. I can't find them. But, oh, jeez! Uh, someday. Someday. Uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, mate. You you got to keep looking in the antique stores. Absolutely, yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, so I picked up the clarinet, played that for a few years, um, and uh, I guess around I don't know, it was eleven or twelve, I started playing guitar. Okay. My my eldest sister's surfer boyfriend uh, left his uh, left his K acoustic, blonde K acoustic guitar at the house, oh. and. Uh, so I picked it up and started playing. I think I started. First thing I learned was Norwegian wood. Oh really? It just come out. Oh wow. Yeah. That's that's a man. That's a great song. I, you know, it's funny. I, I picked up a guitar, tried to teach myself how to play, and that's about as far as I ever got. So that's. I like making a lot of noise on it, but I, that's it, that's cool. So, yeah. So all right. So I got a question for you. Since I just noticed, what are you drinking right now? Because I'm a. I love. Oh, I'm sorry. Beer. Um, I'm drinking. Um, it's a collaboration between um, Saison DuPont, one of my favorite beers out of Belgium, Farmhouse Ale. Okay. And uh, Allagash, which is a, a, a brewery in Maine. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar it, with Allagash, yeah. They did a collaboration called Brewer's Bridge, which is a, uh, a farmhouse ale, which I quite like. Oh, nice, nice. I'm just going simple. I've got a little tea with some vodka in it. Oh, there you go. So, all right. So, now back to the show. At what point did you start playing with band, playing, you know, starting your first bands and, and, and playing with other people? Um, well, let's see. Um, maybe I was 14. Maybe I was 14 or so. And um, we had a band. Oh, God, I got to uh, I have to say the name of the band. <laughs> uh, um, we, it, we, we had this name. We didn't know about Cash McCall, but we called ourselves Citizens Band. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't know about Cash for Paul. So, yeah, uh, we were a citizens band when I was in high school and in college, actually. Um, uh, all original music. Um, kind of after a while, we started playing. But it was kind of more stonesy at the beginning, uh, I guess. Um, uh, we had a female vocalist and a cellist and... Um, is this the is this the band that was playing out with the yeah. other band were playing? Okay. okay. Well, they were, they were also playing Zeppelin. Yeah. They were playing <laughs> originals uh, with rock cello. Operas. Yeah, <laughs> rock yeah. So, at what point did you decide that you know th this is what I want to do? Um, I don't think I ever decided that. I just did it. You know, I okay. don't know that you. That's one of those things you don't. You know, you, you, it's who you are. You know, just do it. You know, you don't decide. I've always had other, you know, real jobs, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah me never, too, unfortunately. I know that. Get feeling. out from under that. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's cool, though. At what point did you uh, move to a human switchboard? That's that's what I was looking for. Well, in order to – this is – I don't know how to characterize this, but I went out from Long Island to graduate high school and went out to Ohio – um, to a college called Wilmington College, and um, that's a Quaker school. Okay. It suited my sensibilities because it was rather uh, very liberal arts, um, kind of let you sort of figure out your own way. And okay. uh, also, a friend of mine from high school went out there the year before me, who was the cellist in the band, by the way. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he went out there, and it was. Yeah, it was kind of hippie-ish kind of thing, I guess. But uh, we went, kept the band together, man, you know. Oh, and, man. Uh, <laughs> they <laughs> played, out, played out there. And eventually that cycle 
completed itself, and I ended up living in Columbus, Ohio, where I met uh, Ron Metz and Bob Pfeiffer and Martin Markarian, and they were uh, once again without a bass player. Okay. Yeah, as you know, <laughs> went through a few. Uh, eventually, I don't know how it happened. After a few years, I ended up in Kent, Ohio, living with the band and playing. Yeah, yeah, that's how that happened. <laughs> All right, and they recorded. Now, I was read, trying to figure this out. Now, they had Human Switchboard has one album. Were you did you play on that, or were you did you play after that? I played after that, after Who's Landing in My Hangar. Yeah, okay. uh, I played. Uh, there is an LP that I'm on, which is a bootleg. Oh. Um, um, I'm not sure how many were made, but there's a bootleg out there with some live stuff on it that I played on. And then there's some stuff I played on later with on guitar um, that came out on Bar None Records a few years back, which was a sort of a, a, com- a compilation of a lot of unreleased tracks and stuff like that. Oh, okay. That was pretty cool. That uh, yeah, I played some guitar on that. Um, but I was a, I was the bass player, um, and uh, we went to um, played Hurrahs. I think we opened up for. Who was it? Who did we open up for? Um, oh God! <laughs> I'm putting you uh, on the spot here. I'm sorry. No, no, you, no. I'm, I'm the one that's trying to remember the name of the band. Uh, it, could it have been the only ones? Maybe it was the only ones. I don't remember. If I remember later, I'll tell you. But yeah, yeah. We played hurrah! Um, I didn't play the Peppermint Lounge gigs that they started doing because I, I actually quit at that point. Ah, oh, okay. I quit, so they fired me. <laughs> well, that's another story. I won't tell that story. That's, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna tell me that story? They just re-released "Who's Landing in My Hangar," so I won't, I won't make any. You know, <laughs> so, how did you move from uh, Human Switchboard to Yola Tango? Well, I landed in New York um, after the Human Switchboard thing. Moved back and um, stayed with my sister for a while on Long Island. Okay. And then I moved into the city, uh, lived on, where was it, uh, was it 10th Street, 9th Street, between 2nd and 3rd, something like that, kind of near the 2nd Avenue Deli there. Okay. I hope you know the geography there. I'm a little bit, fair. I lived in New Jersey, I had some friends in Long Island, so, which okay. kind of surprises me because I don't hear the Long Island accent from you. Well, I lived in, New York, in, in, um, in Ohio for a good seven eight years so they right. kind of weaned it up weaned it out of you yeah and then since then i've i've been back only in manhattan and new jersey so okay so this is about 1980 or so i guess 79 or 80 that i'm in new york and manhattan and uh i'm renting an apartment sharing an apartment with this i work at a place called record city in on broadway and waverly place legendary record store. Oh, okay yeah 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 uh, and after that went bankrupt, um, and the crazy Astro I was living with, uh, got so crazy I had to move out. Uh-oh. Uh, like, how crazy? Place in Hoboken. Like, how crazy are we talking? Oh, he would go away for two, three weeks at a time, and then show up at three in the morning screaming, uh, <laughs> and, you know, it was just, yeah, never mind. Wow. <laughs> that's, okay, that's pretty crazy. I had to leave. I had to leave. Okay. So. <laughs> I, I'm getting that feeling already just for that little bit. Yeah, yeah, um... So yeah, moved into into Hoboken, found a place in Hoboken when it was dirt cheap. Yeah, that's, that's been a while now. Oh yeah, uh, and so just fell in with the crowd. You know, it was the individuals and the and I were in Georgia, and when they were Georgia and those guys. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, the whole crowd of people we played softball every Sunday. Um, oh, nice. Came to be known as Dioxin Field. Uh, <laughs> who knows what went on nearby? It was near the power plant. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you know, people started playing, you know, with each other, and 
you know, Max Wells was the focus of the scene. And, oh, I used to love Max Wells. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. So I played, uh, then I got John Clagis, uh, who was from The Individuals. Okay. And uh, Georgia played the drums, and Ira played guitar, and I played bass, and John played guitar. Um, and um, that went its course. But then that's when Ira and Georgia started putting together a band uh, uh, and asked me to play along, and I did. <laughs> it's fine. Good. All good. Yeah, and, and so that was uh, Ride the Tiger, which came out in 86. Right, right, yeah. All right, and then did you guys, now did you, you left after that album, did you, but did you, were you around for touring with that to support the album? Yeah, yeah, the record came out in the spring, I guess, um, and we went and toured in the summer. It seemed like we were playing college towns in the summer, which I guess didn't, that it didn't make much that, anyway. That's, that's <laughs> one way to go. Yeah, that's a, uh, no, it was okay, uh, but that was cool. Uh, <laughs> it was fun recording that. We recorded it with Clint Conley up in in uh, in Boston. Yeah, that was fun. And then I just felt like I wanted to play more of my own songs and put together my own outfit. So I kind of parted ways after that record. So the, and and that was all amicable, right? You, you just. Oh yeah, it yeah. was. It, there wasn't. There was no part. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. We're, we're obviously we're still good friends. So. Uh. All right, and so you put together a band um, originally called Walking Wounded, right? That's correct. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, that was taken. I think. It was taken, so we had to come up with a name that for a gig we had at CBGBs. So somebody jokingly said, "Oh, call it the Shrams," and so yeah, it stuck. Yeah. So, <laughs> now, so you did you did your first gig as the Shrams. How did you? How did? Why did you decide to? Keep? You said it. You said it stuck. How did you guys just set out? You know what? Was that one of those things where you just like, ah, you know what? It works. Or did you fight it's, it? it? Yeah, it was basically. It was kind of. Um, I guess Chris Damey had a had had a, uh, a take on that. He said, "Well, it's so uh, beautifully." Uh, um, well, not, he didn't say plain vanilla, but beautifully <laughs> unvocative or something. It's just like you can make anything out of it. You, I don't. It's, Walking Wounded was kind of a downer name, you know, kind of. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, the Shrams so has no. To, yeah, you have no preconceived notions through. with the Shrams. Yeah, no, you don't have any idea what's going to go, what you're getting into. Exactly. <laughs> After that, you decided to. You actually started recording your first album. Yeah, yeah. And is it is it true that everybody after during was it recording that first album that some of the band ended up leaving? Well, yeah, it was you know it was, uh, Todd Novak played guitar with us, and uh, Pete Linzel was playing sax. Mike Lewis, who was the bass player from the original uh, Yola Tango uh, Ride the Tiger lineup, okay. Mike Lewis was the bass player. Um, but, you know, people were being pulled different ways. You know, Mike yeah. was about to move to Boston and work for some pharmaceutical company or something. I'm not really sure. So he, he left halfway through the songs okay. uh, being recorded. And uh, I think Todd and Pete wanted to start a uh, sort of a surf band. Okay. Uh, which is fine. You know, it all worked out. Um we got uh, Al Greller from the Tall Lonesome Pines and Peter Stamfel. He was playing with Peter Stamfel in the bottle caps. Um, and uh, I think it worked out pretty well. It, and I, read, I read a story, and you can tell me if this is true or not, because I read it in two different places, but it is the Internet, so you, you, know, you don't know how much <laughs> it's actually true. Um, Terry, the fir- uh, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Is it Caritas? Caritas. Caritas, that- Caritas yeah. Uh, all right, so she initially played bass until her bass was stolen, and then just—it's true, it's true. Oh my <laughs> god! 
She had a beautiful old Dan Electro bass. Uh, oh, no. It's really gorgeous. Uh, you know, very simple, but beautiful. And uh, someone popped the, the trunk on the car and stole it. And, um, uh, and she, I guess, decided instead of... Um, I'm not sure how she switched to keyboards, but she had an interest in keyboards, so she started learning how to play, and Al stepped in to play bass, and I guess there you go. She had been playing bass with um, an early iteration of Yellow Tango, Georgia and those guys. She was the bass player, so. Okay, okay. It's all kind of circles of. (laughs) Circles of amicable departures and, and reconnections. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Now, all right. So that that's a horrible thing to have happen. Is that the worst? Yeah. Is, is that one of the worst things that's happened to you on tour? So you, somebody's instrument gets stolen. Uh, it's just it's just a it's just a guitar, I guess. But you know, there's other things that have happened that uh, that aren't. Uh, you know, I've, I've. Nah, nah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you, you can feel free to share some of these stories. You might, you might feel good to get them off your chest. Well, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad, yeah. Losing an instrument, yeah. Okay. All right, so Walk to Delphi came out in 89. But he, he was on Rough Trade, which just a couple of weeks after it got released, they kind of went out of business, right? Yeah, yeah. It was it was Okra, um, a kind of a subsidiary of Rough Trade. It was basically Rough Trade with a little imprint called Okra. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, they went out of business right after we uh, um, released the record. Luckily, there was a a company in in Germany called Normal that was very interested in uh, uh, putting the record out. So they picked it up, and that started us touring in uh, Europe. And you had a – that created you a big, pretty big following out in Germany because yeah. you, you've also done some solo stuff that's done really yeah. well in Germany too, right? Mm-hmm. I've done – yeah, I did uh, two solo records over there and uh, a solo tour, sort of a half solo tour with Jebloy Nichols, another artist on the Return Sender normal um he had actually had a, a band called the fellow travelers okay which was kind of a reggae band oh was, wow and reggae meets country actually so it was pretty awesome yeah. oh that's pretty cool and he sings kind of like randy travis so he can uh oh my god i'm gonna have yeah. is, is there stuff on youtube or someplace where i can find that probably so probably so yeah that's that's yeah. that's a mix i never would have thought of yeah country reggae <laughs> we actually did a record together with other okra had some country artists so we did a record called the okra all-stars okay where we did uh it was myself it was we actually called it like the hundred dollar quartet or something like that it was uh uh me uh, myself jeb Bloy nichols uh hank mccoy and uh, ricky barnes oh uh, some mm, you know uh, and so we did a tour of Germany with the record. We did a version of uh, Purple Rain, country style. Really? Yeah, really good. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Was that hard to do? I mean, w- first of all... Surprisingly we- easy. Really? It just <laughs> fell together. It was so obvious <laughs> obvious what to do and where, yeah. Now, when you do something like that, I, you cover prints, it, is it something you record first and then ask permission to do later, or do you... Do it the other you way around. You ask permission. You know, you can cover someone's song without asking them. You know. Okay. You, you can, yeah, yeah, you're, you know, they might not like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. well, that's a good point. As long as you give them credit, they're usually pretty happy to hear about it. You know? Okay. That's yeah. now that that is one thing I'm going to have to try to find because I didn't I didn't find that anywhere. Oh, okay. I, I get, maybe I can get my hands on a copy and send it to you. Maybe. That would be amazing. All right, so. So the, the the first album comes out, uh, and you also end up doing one of your songs that you all that you did previously with Yola Tango. So, uh, right, um, the way some people die. The 
way some people die. Um, yeah, it was on the first. It was on Ride the Tiger. It was also a second song we did. We did a song on the Ride the Tiger called I think we called it Nine Years or I'm not sure which was which. One was called Nine Years, and the the second version was called Five Years or vice versa. I okay. did on the second. Ah, but, okay, okay. And, and I don't know why I did that. But. <laughs> All right, so this is like the eighty nine ninety time frame, right? Right. All right, and then so then you came out with uh, Little Apocalypse and and Dizzy Spell, and then went back to Yola Tango. Oh, right. Is that, is well, that the for, way it goes? For Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Uh, it was about nineteen. Actually, Facebook was right after Walk to Delphi. I think it was nineteen ninety. I think. Oh, okay. Oh, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yes, you're right. I'm, I'm looking at my no- my notes are all scrambled today. I don't know what's going on. It's okay. Luckily, my brain is not at this moment. So. <laughs> maybe after a few more beers, and then maybe my notes will make sense. Yeah, working on that. Yeah. I, now, I, I need to have a little more drink, because then maybe my, my notes will make sense to both of us. There you go. So, okay, so 1990, and you guys work on Fakebook, which turns out to be a great name, you know, a decade later. I, yeah, okay? wonderful, yeah. <laughs> it almost, I was trying, when we, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it, it's almost a commentary on, on technology that hadn't existed at that time yes yes so and i, and I gotta tell you uh barnaby hardly working is one of my favorite songs i've heard from you i, I absolutely love cool. the guitar yeah, work on that I think my, my favorite stuff on that record, not that there's anything bad on there, I don't think, but uh, are their originals, not the covers. And it's a record of covers, but it has a few originals. Yeah. And I love uh, The Summer and Barnaby Hardly Working and um, uh, their original songs there. So. And I wanted to ask you about that because it seems like that's the same uh, – you, you guys went back to that formula for the – 2015 Yola Tango album that you're on, mm-hmm. stuff like that there. Yes, yeah, Son of the Fake Book. Yeah. You're right. Is it now? Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that the way you guys plan to do the album? Is to do uh, some covers interspersed with some originals? Or is it like you're warming up and hey, that sounds good? Or is there, or is there a plan no, going I think, in? I think for, st- for both records, there was a plan to, to play songs that they loved, right? Okay. And, and then intersperse it with a few originals like just like on stuff like that there they've done this it's basically the same methodology um uh and i think they do to great effect yeah i think it's i think that their song choices on both records are pretty phenomenal yeah oh they're they're fantastic yeah. i mean and because you guys you do um Covers of Cat Stevens, Gene Clark, Flaming Groovies, John Cale, The Cure, Hank Williams. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a really you guys cut a really wide swath with your with the covers. Yep. There's so many different genres in there, and and they all flow. Sun Ra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but they all they all work together with the sound that you guys are creating with them. So that it's yeah, yeah. I mean, stuff like that. There, the um, uh, what is the opening track? Why am I blanking on that? Um, um, uh, is it does it. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm bl- blanking too. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's, uh, oh crap, I'll have to look it up while we're talking here. Anyway, the, the first uh, three or four tracks on that just, they're so beautiful. It's just, yeah. the, the guitar work and the vocals, it's just, everything meshes so perfectly. And what I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll just throw the audio clip in there at that time and everybody can hear what it sounds like. Okay. <laughs> So how does it happen that you got you, you come back to Yola Tango? Do they contact you or do you contact them and they, they just want a certain sound? Or? Yeah, we stay in touch. I've done a lot of the Hanukkah shows and um, the odd uh, trip to Berlin for a... Uh, a retrospective radio, sh- uh, a record, sorry, a retrospective record label show. Okay. That's really good. Um, 
uh, and then, you know, they just asked me whether I was interested in um, not only recording the record, but would be available to do the tour afterwards. And, you know, how can you say now? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. The one thing that I've, I've that I've noticed listening to Yola Tango with you and, and without you is that with you, it, it seems to be a little more controlled with you in, in the band. There's, there's the songs aren't as like frenetic and, and, well, I think Angular. it's because uh, lately, last, um, you know, the last recordings and stuff like this, we it's mostly the sort of the stripped down acoustic uh, version, okay. uh, which is a, a one beautiful side of them. Um, uh, don't make a mistake. I love getting loud and noisy with uh, the best of them. So uh, <laughs> at some of the Hanukkah shows, we've done that together. And that's that's great fun, too. Yeah. So, well, that's one of the things I liked about the music and, and on the new album, um, Omnidirectional, it's, you get these beautiful lines, these beautiful songs, and they're, they, some of them are incredibly soft and delicate, but there's also this feedback coming in or this fuzzed out guitar or somewhere that, that comes in out of nowhere. And it's, that, that is my favorite thing to hear. I absolutely... Oh, cool. Either, nice, thank you. When when it comes like that, or it's the other way around, when there's something really fuzzed and crazy coming out, I mean, there's like this delicate piano line going through it too. It's the 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 dichotomy of it. I I love it, and and you've mastered that as spe- oh. or specifically on the new album. It's I, I've been listening to it constantly for days now. Oh, awesome! So, Thanks, You're great. Awesome. Yeah. In fact, I will tell you right now. Um, the New England is one of my favorite tracks, um, and then. Oh. What's uh, 2 a.m. slant? Uh, I love that uh, song. Song. That, that kind of, I get a, like a Leo Kotke, uh, John Fahey kind of feel with the guitar playing, and then and it, I, I love it because okay, it's just a beautiful instrumental, and it's it's so. I, I what it makes me want it makes me want to cut the top off of my sedan and just drive around in the nice, <laughs> somewhat warm summer night. It's just it, that's the kind of music. That, that this album has and it just kind of makes me want to drive around with no top with no top on my car I'll keep my top on nice alright nice, nice image I like it yeah, yes nobody wants to see me with no top on so yeah <laughs> but you also you've also done some interesting session work is that yeah. something that yeah. is that something that you try to space out in between or is it just are you picky about it um yes yeah, so, you know you don't want to play horrible music with horrible people so you know <laughs> that's yeah. true i've been lucky to have been asked to play with some um some people i love and people the music i love i've got some sort Ooh, of like fire going sirens on. yeah yeah there's a fire truck hoboken is burning yeah. Hold on. we'll give it a minute give it a second yeah all right <laughs> no they're not gone there still here hope it's not my house let me see <laughs> yeah give me to take a look <laughs> no, he's gone. He's going. All right. <laughs> I wish I could say that's a first, but you'd be amazed at how many interviews yeah. I do with people and there's sirens going all over the place. Fortunately, yeah, no one's so house I, has burned down yet. Yeah. No, luckily. <laughs> um, I ha- happy to have been played with like Freddie Johnston. To have played with Freddie Johnston. Um, uh, getting to play on the. Uh, the All Shook Down sessions was pretty pretty great uh, with Paul Westerberg, the replacements. Oh, right, yeah. And then Soul Asylum, um, Richard Buckner. That was awesome. That's where I first met, you know, got, t- got in touch with JD, JD Foster. Oh, okay. Who produced this record, Omnidirectional, and the previous one, 100 Questions. So that's where the hookup with JD happened. 
Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and Richard Bach. Yeah. All right, so let me ask you a couple questions about the new album. There, it's a 10-year gap between this album and your previous album. Why so long? Were you, were you busy or you just didn't feel like writing anything or is there some other reason? It's a couple of things. I mean, I can't say that it's some of it's not laziness. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, being a, a new father, um, uh, a lot of other things. Uh, it's a lot of different things. It's, it's a lot of fires and, going on. Uh, here's part two. <laughs> All right. Um, Part of it is um, having a different, having my relationship to the whole music industry change in a way. um, Things had changed to the point where um, I was out of that cycle of record a record, put out the record, tour, tour a little more come back, write music, record a record, put out the record, tour. That cycle wasn't really happening anymore, um, uh, partly because the music industry had changed somewhat, and okay. uh, it was harder to do that, in a way. Um, and uh, we had had always a certain amount of success in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Europe, uh, and some in America, but you know, never enough to sustain uh, an independent a career, independent of other parts of life. You know, a, right? A, a day job and all that kind of stuff. Right. 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 So maybe that's a factor. Plus, I started doing also this thing called Radio Free Song Club. Oh, what's um, that? Uh, it's a podcast that we started around two thousand nine. And um, it was basically a club of songwriters. Um, it's Kate Jacobs' idea. She's a, a singer-songwriter I've done a lot of work with, played a lot on, on her records. Um, and um, we started this podcast where it's basically it was a pretend radio show, basically. Okay. As most podcasts kind of are. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I know that one. The premise was every month, it started out every month, um, we would have uh, a group of songwriters submit a new song okay. to be played on the show. Uh, and it was myself and Kate Jacobs. Nicholas Hill signed on as the uh, uh, the show host. Okay. He's a... Um, uh, a DJ who was on WFMU and a lot of other places like that. Um, awesome fellow. Um, and uh, so the original club of um, uh, songwriters was myself, Kate Jacobs, Freddie Johnston, Victoria Williams, Robin Holcomb, Peter Holzapple, Peter Blegved, Jody Harris. I hope I don't forget anybody. Uh, Laura Cantrell. <laughs> Um, who else? Um, uh, and eventually we a- uh, added Don Piper, Amy Allison, Hal Gelb. Wow. Uh, Reckless Eric and Amy Rigby. Oh, cool. Um, and I'm forgetting someone and it's horrible that I'm forgetting someone. Uh, uh, anyway, so they probably won't hear this show. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who listens to that? Yeah. Exactly. Nobody listens to podcasts, especially <laughs> this one. Uh, so, yeah, um, they would each bring a, a new song every month, and we would put it into a, like a radio station, a radio show format. Wow. Uh, it's fascinating to hear what people were working on. Uh, you got some heavy bet, hitters in there, too. Some great people, some wonderful people, and we would, um, although it became less and less every month, it started becoming two months, three months, because it was getting hard to get it all together every single month. Yeah, I know that feeling. But it sort of developed into a, a house band that would have guests on the show, and we would learn the songs that afternoon and play them live on the show that, that night. Oh, wow. It was so much fun. It was all kind of like being in the, uh, the Wrecking Crew or something. Right, <laughs> yeah. My, it was uh, myself, mostly David Mansfield, you know, from... Um, 
uh, great mandolin, violin player. He was in the Rolling Thunder review with Bob Dylan and the gang oh, there. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking J.D. About. Foster, um, Jeremy Chasky, wow. Paul Michelle, Conrad Meisner, um, Rob Berger, all sorts of great people played in, the, in this wow. this all star band. We we put together every every couple of months. So that's kind of on hiatus right now, but that took a lot of time. It took a lot of that's by way of explaining explaining what else I was doing. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, well, that makes sense. Link. There's some great, great, great stuff there. We yeah. had some great guests. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I'd I'd love to hear some of that. And if, if as long as you don't mind me reposting some of that, like, in, you know, sending links out and in tweets. And Not stuff. at all. No, no. I it's would, all, we did it all for free for love. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'll, with, with half those people involved, I would love to hear what's going on with that or yeah. what was going on with that. Yeah. All right, so so, so that explains the 10-year your gap here. Um, do you go in with songs already composed or are you going in with just ideas? Uh, we had, I actually did demos for most every song on the record. Okay. Um, at home, uh, way back in 2005, I think just 2004, some of the songs are from two, you know, one of the songs, the first song on the record was a song I played with uh, Yola Tango on the Rock the Vote tour in 2004. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that, we played that on that tour. So and that's kind of why James McNew is, is singing on that song. He's okay, he's okay. singing the part that he wrote for, the, for when we were on tour in 2004. So that's an l- old one there. So that's yeah. Honestly Now, right? Honestly now, yeah. That oh, I, that's a great song. I absolutely love it. Cool. it it's the uh, the the horn opening, and then the the beautifully strummed acoustic, and then the feedback hits you, and I and oh, that's like I said before. That's the noise. The, I love that sound. I love that cool. that effect. It it, it just it just hits me somewhere in particular that I absolutely am not going to show anybody. <laughs> but, all right, so I've, I do have a question about some some of the instruments that you use, some of the equipment that you guys use. Still standing, still has this beautiful. Is it? A, is that a dulcimer in it? It's a marxophone, um, oh, and it's played by Andy marxophone? Burton. And it um, one of the reasons we did one of the reasons we did the record um, at Andy Taub's studio in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Recording, um, is because of his amazing collection of instruments, amps, guitars, and stuff. He's also an amazing engineer and a great guy, and has amazing ears. But okay. he also has some great stuff in the studio. So he had that along with many other things. He had a mark, so he had that microphone. Well, he had two of them actually, um, and I think that's the that's that's the instrument that's on Death of a Clown. I think. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, if you think of that song, yeah. Okay. Oh man! Right. I never I never heard of a microphone before that. It's got a beautiful sound to it. It has these keys that hit the the, the multiple strings for each note. But the string, the the key m- moves a uh, a metal hammer, which is on sort of a spring steel shaft, which can. Um, um, I'm giving you a visual like a, bow- a visual aid there, like that. Yes. Yeah. So that's what happens, but <laughs> your listeners can't see which that. Which is good for podcasts. Yeah, good for podcasts. <laughs> so it just kind of bounces along, and and yeah, it kind of bounces on the string. Gives it like a, like almost like a hammer dulcimer kind of sound. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's I I love it, and and. Um, the day when the the intro is fantastic, and I'm trying to is it is it are they called vibes? It sounds like a xylophone kind yeah, of yeah, vibraphone. Vibraphone. Yeah. That's what a, vibraphone. I yeah. Never, I, I never remember that. I've heard that on few several albums, and I've asked people, and they tell me, and I for some reason that escapes me every time, and I just call it Lionel Hampton vibes. <laughs> yeah, Lionel Hampton was the uh, man who made that famous thing. You're, uh, do you use any like vintage equipment yourself? Any guitar? Because you've got a, a great clean tone and and a, a perfect fuzz tone. It's it's 
fantastic. And it sounds like you're using vintage equipment. Is is that the case? Yeah, a, a lot of it is. I'm, I don't think I even played any of my own instruments oh, on wow. the record. Andy had so much there. I kind of just went into his, his the room with all the stuff and just grabbed something that looked appropriate. Um, <laughs> Most of it is, vin- yeah, I mean, there's a lot of it's um, vintage or boutique stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, on um, honestly now, all that feedback is generated by, uh, actually, the first time I ever played through a Marshall stack. Oh, really? And I, actually, I was in the ISO booth with the Marshalls, uh, with earplugs in, uh, <laughs> getting those sounds uh, out of a big hollow body Gibson and the Marshall stack, kind of like... Uh, just massive SPLs. Oh, you know, man. Crazy. And you can you But yeah, and then there's, there's like on, on Horse and Diamonds, I'm playing a, an old 30s Rickenbacker lap steel through a, a, a Gibson Lancer amp. You know, you can get totally geeked out if you want, but you know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I will. I will get totally geeked out on that stuff because I, I love old equipment. I mean, I like new equipment too, but. I guess just I'll get geeked out on the equipment. It doesn't really matter. And it's it's funny because I don't really play anything. I don't have any of it, but I just I love the sounds it makes. It's just Yeah. So I will confess, I will confess, there's a moment on one of the songs on Faith is a Dusty Word where you hear a Mellotron flute sound. Mm-hmm. And we originally started recording it on Andy's Mellotron. But it was a little off. Okay. I mean more off than Mellotrons can be right, <laughs> and so he had basically an electronic Mellotron, which was something that was a simulator, a Mellotron simulator, and we use that instead. Oh so man, tech! Some it new sounded tech better. In it. Stayed yeah. in tune. Yeah. <laughs> well, are, are you are you planning on going out to support the album? We're gonna do what we can. Uh, we didn't. It, it, it seems strange that uh, to say this, but although we spent 10 years making the record, um, the run up to releasing it, um, not a whole lot of uh, planning went into um, uh, gigs and stuff. Which So we're only okay. now starting to put that together. So Okay. I don't know uh, how that's we're gonna, we're gonna, we did two shows in the New York area. We're going to do the third one as a record release. And then we're going to do some shows up around the Northeast. I hope so. Oh, excellent, excellent. And, uh, but we didn't. We were we were not ahead of the curve enough uh, to put together a European tour because there you need almost a year to set things up, basically. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. I know. I've heard. Nine months. Oh, really? I, I've heard the opposite is true uh, from some of the Canadian artists I've had. They said it's expensive and time consuming to get a work visa to come down and tour in there so i imagine the opposite is also true yeah i don't know anyway we'll prior tour for the next record okay well where yeah. can people find you on online social media where can they purchase the album or pre-order uh, it, I think? bar none records uh selling it online um hopefully uh, you get it other places as well and uh, it's going to be on i guess it's going to be available well, we'll have our website, theshrams.com. That's, we'll have links to where you can purchase it. So it'll be findable. It'll be fine. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, now, do you guys do a lot of social media work? Do you guys uh, promote uh, Well, I've got, you know, we have a Facebook page for the band, okay. and uh, that's under the Shrams. And we just, I guess we just started some Twitter and Instagram stuff. So we'll start doing some more of that. Awesome. Awesome. You know, on those spaces those places yeah yeah <laughs> all the grams and the whatever's yes Man, david thank Twitter you gram, whatever it's called yeah exactly <laughs> insta face i don't know david thank you so much for spending your, your evening with me I've, i know I've, I've taken up you know almost an hour of your time so man, i really do appreciate cool, yeah. it thanks thanks for calling yeah